We move on now to uh, questions to the Minister for Social Development. And I call Mrs. Sander Overend. Question number one, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My department adheres to best practice in both identifying and disposing of surplus assets. Uh, this best practice is set out in the Department of Finance and Personnel Guidance, the disposal of surplus public property in Northern Ireland. Last year, for example, my department achieved $3.38 million on receipts from the sale of surplus assets and has a target to achieve $5 million in this current financial year. I'm pleased to report that we are well on course on achieving this particular target. In the broader context, the Executive approved its asset management strategy in June uh, 2013. And one of the recommendations was to establish a central disposal unit within DFP Properties Division by April of 2017 for the processing of all surplus assets from all departments. This is being taken forward under the reform of property management programme, which is a DFP project supported by the Strategic Investment Board, and my department is fully engaged in this process. The Housing Executive has advised that it currently has uh, 21 sites on its land disposal programme for 1516 for sale on the open market valued at 1.9 million. Offers have been received on seven sites, totaling uh, almost uh, 0.57 million, but no sales have yet been completed. The value of the undeveloped uh, land schedule surplus site sold in 1415 was £160,450, and in 1314 was £117,500. The Housing Executive has advised that the figures at two uh, above do not include the lands transferred to housing associations, which are nil consideration as they do not represent the total of all the land disposals, for example, open space lands and leases. Well, Mrs. Overend for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for uh, the vast figures that I outlined there. While I recognise that on paper uh, the Minister's department does well in capital receipts, does he accept that much of that comes from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive using public funds to pay his department so it's not true revenue uh, in, in people's eyes? And given the extent uh, of surplus lands owned by the Housing Executive, uh, for instance, does the Minister believe that the target uh, that he said and he referred to is well underway of uh, reaching it? Uh, does he agree that that's possibly too low? Uh, thank the member for supplement, uh, supplement the question. Obviously, in any of these, I would like to be in a position where we were uh, disposing of assets in a way which was generating more revenue for us, given the current debate that we're having in this House today, particularly in relation uh, to the budget issue. However, I think the, the targets have to be realistic, and I think if you look at the past uh, record in relation to this, there has been uh, an attempt to ensure that we didn't overestimate what was potentially achievable and as a result of the, the monies that have come in that has been uh, realistic uh, in relation to that. In terms of the point that the member makes about this is all public money, the, the, the member is right in terms of this is all uh, under the responsibility and due diligence of the public person. I think that's all the more reason why we have to ensure when we possibly can we get the best possible outcome for the sales that we enter into. Mr. Sean Rogers for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, has your department brought, bought any new buildings either in the last financial year or this year? Uh, I haven't got the detail in relation to, to that particular issue that the member raised. I will provide him with the detail in terms of the specifics. Well, Mrs. Rosie McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, can I ask the Minister how many dis district councils have requested the transfer of DSD staff to support the transfer of regeneration powers and functions to local government? Well, as the, the member is aware, we're, we're specifically talking in relation to land purchase and land disposal, but I'm quite happy to make reference to the issue of uh, the issue of staff. Uh, I've continued to have discussions with the councils in relation to the potential uh, success of the Regeneration Bill, which comes up uh, later on in questions uh, in the House. And if that is the case and we transfer the, 
the functions. That will be an issue for the individual councils. To date, uh, there has been a small number of councils who have expressed uh, an interest. And so uh, that is something that we will continue to work with councils so that we maximise the benefit for the council and we get an agreed position in relation to what will be the ultimate complement. I'm quite happy to provide the member in terms of the actual numbers, but in terms of all the councils, it's relatively small. Mr. David Hildage for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question two. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, as you are aware, under the reform of local government, my department will confer powers and budgets to enable councils to decide how best to take forward the regeneration and community development in their areas. The financial allocation available to local government from the 1st of April uh, 2016 onwards is 56.5 million. In order to determine the percentage of the 56.5 million that should be allocated to each council, the department devised a funding allocation model. The allocation awarded to each council in the model is largely determined on the following basis of appointment income derived population settlement bands, uh, total population for physical development, income uh, deprived population of district for community development, and programme costs, excluding the lagging side. For salaries. In terms of the human resources, the arrangements are in place to allow the new council access on a voluntary secondment basis to staff from within my department with regeneration and community development expertise. And my officials will continue to liaise with councils to determine their requirements, as I already have mentioned to the previous uh, uh, question. In terms of general assistance, uh, my officials are working closely with the councils to assist them in putting in place effective arrangements to meet the needs of their communities. Officials have recently reviewed all existing projects for support in 1516, and the outcome of these reviews are being made available to councils to enable them to take informed decisions about the arrangements they wish to put in place. And indeed, in regards to the community uh, planning element of all of this, uh, I recently met with my officials because I had some concern that in regards to the way that we were implementing this, uh, I wanted to be absolutely sure that in the functions which Registered are the responsibility of our department, that they were being done in a way that was with the councils. Mr. Heldes, for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for, for his detailed answer. I'm glad to hear that the liaison will continue between the department and the councils. Could he, could he give us an overview again just of how that financial allocation at each of the councils was determined then? Yes, I thank the, the member for his supplementary. And obviously, this was an issue which caused concern and raised questions. And I have endeavoured during the conversations that we've had with councils to explain it to them in as best a way that I possibly can, so that they are absolutely sure that we endeavour to do all that we, we did to give them a fair allocation across the 11 councils. And the development of the methodology for the distribution of funds for urban regeneration and community development was the outworking of the executive's policy decision to transfer, transfer the functions in the first place. The model is designed to provide the local government with the objectivity-based allocations that take into account both population and deprivation, and DSD can only transfer to the new councils the relevant budgets and the physical assets associated with the delivery. The budget being transferred is mostly that which is being used for the current implementation of the urban uh, policies by the department, and those policies currently applied only to settlements of as the member will know, 4,500 persons and above. And the definition recommended by the Northern Ireland Statistical Research Agency uh, uh, in their report back in 2005. However, the department recognised that the new councils uh, may want to deliver regeneration programmes in smaller settlements. And for the reasons that proposed distribution for funding is based on the use of population figures down to settlements of 1,000 persons, resulting overall in councils with more rural populations receiving a greater share of the budget than would have been the case if we decided to apply 
the 4,500 uh, urban cut-off in a very rigid way. And this has resulted in a skewing of the resources from largely urban-based councils to the more rural uh, counterparts in uh, places such as uh, Fermanagh and the West. And I think that that was welcomed by those councils which have felt that in terms of the allocation process that sometimes it was always the bigger councils that got the allocation and the smaller councils were those that were left out uh, with a lesser amount of money. Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And following through to, to the Minister and acknowledging the, the important, serious importance of urban regeneration, can the Minister assure the House that and the priorities going forward, the target and social need will still become the priority in terms of the allocation of that funding? Well, of course, if the, if the bill is successful and the powers are transferred in 16, it will ultimately be for the councils to determine as to how they use that money. And I have, I have said this uh, to councils that I have met. Uh, and, and there is a concern that is now growing amongst uh, some councils across uh, Northern Ireland that members in those authorities may have different priorities. They may have a different focus. And what I'm ensuring to do is that it is entirely the issue for the councils as to how they will uh, use that money, but also to ensure that they take into account the needs of the community that they serve. And if, if we believe that all council uh, is, the, is local, then surely those at the very grassroots uh, of our pol uh, political process in Northern Ireland should be best placed to be able to identify what are the needs in their locality. And I think I would say this as well. The other element to this is that they now have a responsibility in relation to community planning. So there has to be a, a joined up approach. Uh, it is something that I have a concern about. It is something that I want to ensure is done in a way that is to maximise the best possible outcome for the councils. But they, as the lead authority when they have the power and the resource, will have to determine in conjunction with their elected representatives on the various elements of information, a guidance that is issued from my own department and the community planning process, that they are doing it in a way that is best tailored to meet the needs of their community. And Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister confirm that it would be equitable if he were to uh, uh, restrict funding to, say, groups larger than 4,000, and in fact it was because of equality reasons that uh, smaller pockets of deprivation were not excluded in the past, and would he confirm that this will continue to be, they will continue to be assisted in the future? You know, I think, and I thank the member for that, the, the aim is to ensure that it is equitable as far as we possibly can within the resources that are, are available. And obviously there was an issue in the past where there was a cut-off point of 4,500. There was a, a view that if you reduced it to smaller conurbations, then councils that have made representations, and I have had those discussions, I think, now with most, and maybe, I think maybe two councils that I still have to meet, but certainly there was a clear indication from the local authorities that they wanted to be in a position where, where there was a smaller uh, number of persons within their particular community that they uh, were able to be of help or assistance. However, given the uh, amount of money that we're discussing or, or talking about here, it is a limited resource and there are many needs, whether they are within conurbations of a thousand person or beyond four and a half thousand. So it is an issue where the council will have to ensure they do it in a way as best as they possibly can that doesn't create the situation that the member outlines. Mr Jim Allister. In terms of the public realm scheme and its contribution to urban regeneration, uh, can the Minister respond to the concerns of the traders in Church Street, Ballymena, that upon the onset of the public realm scheme a couple of weeks ago, the pavements were dug up, were dug up and then everything has been at a standstill for days on end with no further work done, uh, much in contradiction of the assurances given to uh, the traders in advance of the work starting. Can the Minister seek to address and tighten up that situation? I thank the, the member for his uh, question. Obviously, uh, while it's uh, beyond slightly the, the remit of the, the question is asked, quite happy to answer it. The, the work uh, which is being invested, the money that's being invested in Ballymena is somewhere in the region of £4.6 million, which is very welcome by the traders, very welcome by the town, and I'm sure the member 
like myself, would have been the first person to have been complaining if we didn't have had an investment in Ballymena as a premier town in Northern Ireland for retail and for uh, many other of the shopping experiences that people enjoy when they come to the town. In terms of the specifics, uh, I have met with the traders, I have met with individual traders. I'm going back again this week uh, to meet with the Council in relation to the issue because the Council will have responsibility for uh, the uh, management of the works. And the, the work on the Ballymena Public Realm Scheme actually commenced on ground on the 18th of May and is anticipated to last for some 80 weeks and to be completed by November of 2016. I take on board the concerns that have been raised and continue to be raised, and I am asking both the Council and the contractor uh, to ensure that everything is done to minimise the disruption, because an 80-week uh, project of this uh, magnitude will undoubtedly have particular challenges. And I think it is important that we try to work with the traders. Uh, I have received correspondence from uh, my colleague, the MP for the area, in relation to the issue of compensation uh, for uh, traders. Uh, there are other requests that have got, come in in regards to specifics, and we're working our way through those uh, so that we do all that we possibly can. I think the other point that I would also make is that we have learned from other uh, public realm schemes where uh, they have been carried out in this way and to avoid some of the, the particular issues, and I trust that that will be the case in relation to Ballymena. Call Lord Morrow for a question. Question number three. Uh, in the four-year period just ended, my department funded registered housing associations to provide over 6,100 new high-quality, uh, energy-efficient social homes in areas of need across Northern Ireland. The programme for government a target set by the Northern Ireland Executive was to deliver 6,000 houses, uh, so the overachievement was a good result for those uh, on the housing waiting list. Plans uh, to deliver at least a further 1,500 more new homes are in the current year. At this point, I want to acknowledge the contribution made by the housing association sector, not least for the £315 million of private finance which was levered in as part fund for the building programme. Uh, and that in itself makes a tremendous addition to the work that we can do every year to help those in housing need. Housing associations build some of the very uh, best housing to be found in Northern Ireland. And they provide not only the housing for families, but supported housing for some of our most vulnerable ci citizens. We, uh, we can be rightly proud that our social housing standards are very much at the envy of other jurisdictions. And in fact, uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, when we look in terms of output, uh, I believe that we are doing uh, much better. Recent figures show that in England, one new social house was being provided for every 60 applicants on the waiting list. The figure for Scotland and Wales was better, but the figure for Northern Ireland was best, with one social house being built for every 30 or so applicants. In relative terms, therefore, we are outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom in relation to this issue. Call Lord Morrow for supplement. Well, I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive reply. And, uh, I'm sure the Minister, like everyone else in here, recognises that there is a considerable waiting list. Can the Minister tell us today, is he and his department on target uh, with all its housing provision, or is there uh, a miss or a lack here? I think in relation to have the targets for the delivery uh, of social and affordable housing been met, I think the answer is yes, uh, because uh, the total uh, of 10,066 homes have been delivered in Northern Ireland over the current programme for government. As I said, 6,101 uh, 6, of these were social homes and 3,965 were affordable homes. And that's, believe it or not, over 2,000 more homes than was promised. And I think that it's not often that uh, ministers stand in this House and actually are able to say that something which has exceeded a programme for government uh, target. And the individual targets for all four years were exceeded each year, with 1,410 homes delivered in 11-12, 1,379 in 12-13, almost 1,300 delivered in 13-14, and 2,000 13 delivered in 14-15. Uh, I think that does all go well 
for uh, how we plan in the future. It is a good news story for those, particularly for those people who are now in receipt of good quality homes, and I look forward to ensuring that we continue to do the same in the future. Mr. Dolores Kelly for supplement. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I, I listened carefully to what the Minister had to say, and no doubt uh, there have been uh, some achievements. But nonetheless, Minister, would you not uh, acknowledge the fact that we are and have been for some time in a housing crisis? And to compare us to GB is to compare one crisis to another. And I wonder, Minister, had you given any further thought in your reform or review of the housing executive whether or not uh, the, uh, the housing executive would be able to? Uh, uh, put in a submission to, to the European Investment Bank to build houses again? Well, I, I thank the member and also thank her for the work that she does uh, in relation to this issue on the Social Development Committee, and obviously she has a particular interest. I would like to see a situation where the housing executive were once again back at the forefront of continuing to build and continuing to provide. However, I think that over the last number of years, we have seen the challenges that have been created, and I think that what I want to ensure is that in, the, in terms of the housing provision, the one thing that I have seen in the time that I have now been in post is the variety of provision. It cannot all be one size fits all, so it has to be a multiplicity of providers. So that will come in this case from uh, whether it's the housing executive in terms of being a good landlord and ensuring that its properties are kept up uh, to the standard that I believe they should. And we have fallen behind in terms of that issue. And I think very soon I will be announcing the outcome of the Stavel uh, Stoke Condition Survey, which I think will clearly indicate to us the huge amount of investment that is needed. In terms of housing associations, we have seen the progress that has been made, and I'm having ongoing discussions with housing associations as to how we can, I think, better improve our relationships. And I think they are key. Uh, and also, uh, particular issues, and members have raised this in the House uh, before, particularly around tar blocks, the, the way in which the housing executive needs to address those particular issues. Those are all matters that are currently under consideration in a variety of ways, but the focus must remain for myself as a minister and for the department that we continue to work with all providers to get the best possible outcome and delivery for the people of Northern Ireland. Mr. Michael Midjams. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I agree with the Minister that we do provide good quality public housing? Uh, the problem and the issue, of course, is there's simply not enough of it. What effect does he believe the projected 2,000 per year or this year being reduced to 1,500, a 25% reduction, what effect is that going to have on the waiting list, particularly for the provision of, of vitally needed family sized housing? Well, I think that whenever you get to a situation where you have to cut your cloth according to the amount of money that you have, it will obviously have an impact. And I would like to be in a position where we were exceeding what was the plan, where we were actually doing more than what we intended to do. However, uh, I think, yes, much has been achieved, and there is no doubt that there is uh, much more that needs to be done. But in the current financial uh, circumstances that we face, in the uh, situation where we have a reduced overall amount of money that is available. I think that we have to do what we, what the best we possibly can with the amount of money that is available to us. But there is no doubt that that has an impact on uh, communities, that has an impact on various locations uh, where there is a greater need or a greater demand. And that's the challenge, I think, for both my department and for everybody really following on from the comments that I made to the previous uh, member, that of all the, those involved in the provision of housing in Northern Ireland, and let's not forget also, because uh, I attended a, a meeting just recently with the uh, CBI, and uh, a very useful exchange, I have to say, with a variety of providers from uh, co-ownership through to the bankers also being uh, in, in that meeting. And it was an, a very open discussion around uh, how we could continue to provide good quality homes in Northern Ireland. And let's not leave out the private sector that continues to make and is showing some recovery in relation to what it provides in Northern Ireland. So it has to be uh, an all-rounded provision and not just solely focusing upon one element. But there's no doubt there are challenges that remain for us in terms of the budget. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, out of all those new social homes built in the last few years, 
How many of them are under the shared housing uh, scheme? I wouldn't have the exact figures uh, to be able to give the members, so I'm quite happy to come back and give the detail and a breakdown in relation to the figures which I announced earlier. Mr. Chris Hazard for a question. Chris Ever Cahar, let a hold question number four, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my department has no authority to control the level of service charges set by the housing associations. However, the department reviews service charges through the inspection regime and by uh, quarterly financial monitoring. The inspection reviews the appropriateness of the arrangements that housing associations have in place to determine the level of service charges and the process for collecting those costs. The monitoring team receives and reviews quarterly financial information relating to the service charge income and cost. My department is currently developing a comprehensive proposals for a social housing rent policy, and the proposals will also look at the fairness, consistency and transparency in relation to service charges. Mr. Hazard for supplementary. I welcome uh, the answer and I thank the Minister for, for the answer. I, I welcome the, in, the, the report and the process that he speaks of bringing forward. Uh, is there a timeline available for this uh, when tenants could maybe expect this to kick into action? Um, thank the member for the supplementary. In terms of the uh, getting out for consultation, it would be my intention to go out over the summer in relation to this. And obviously, uh, that always raises the question, has this been done over the summer because people are away on holidays? And, uh, and I can assure the member and I can assure the House, this is an issue that will generate a considerable degree of debate. This is an issue that has already caused some, particularly in relation to, if we look at an issue, for example, of, of a rent policy, where housing associations already have made uh, uh, representation to myself a representation to the department around this. I think it's an issue that they even raised uh, when they were recently with the committee. But I'm equally uh, also aware of concerns that have been raised right across the piece in relation to the particular way in which we uh, ensure that we don't have excessive rents, uh, but that equally we do have uh, people living in homes who are getting value for money in the rent that they currently uh, are being charged. And that goes right across the piece, whether it be in the housing executive properties or also in housing associations. So I have taken a pragmatic view, I trust, to this particular issue. I don't want to scare the horses. I don't want to create alarm. But what I want to do is have an informed discussion around how we get the best possible outcome that, again, secures tenure for people in their homes and also gives to them the assurance that they are not being overcharged for services that are not being provided. Gordon Dunn for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers. Does the Minister recognise, and it's following on from what he's already said, does he recognise the very real concerns that there are amongst housing association tenants about the management of service charges and what they really relate to? Yes, uh, I think the answer to the, the question that the, the minister or the uh, member, no, that may be a prophecy, it may be, it may be a minister some of these days. Uh, but yes, because the, the one thing that you're not long in post in, in any of these positions in this House until you suddenly realise uh, the particular issues that are prevalent and the particular concerns that various groups and various uh, interests raise. And of course, one of them is concerning uh, the issue of rent. But I have to say, uh, we get also some very good feedback and some very positive messages that come back to us from a variety of sources, both within the housing executive provision and also within uh, the housing association and also the issue of co-ownership. where there are, And again, goes back to the point that I made earlier, we have a, a, a patchwork quilt of provision. We have uh, a, a variety of providers and I want to ensure that in whatever sector the homes are being provided that it has been done in a way which is fair, equitable and gives quality of provision for those people who live in those homes. Call Mr Paul Gervin. Uh, question number five. Thank the member for uh, his uh, question. I'm glad to see that he has an interest 
in what goes on in our maiden city. And uh, I can uh, say to the member that uh, the Ligon Weir pedestrian cycle bridge is on programme to be opened uh, to the public before the Tall Ships event, which is due to take place in July of this year. Call Mr. Gervin for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm just wondering, could the Minister outline what benefits the Ligon uh, footbridge and cycle path will bring to Belfast City Centre? Uh, I thank the member for his supplementary, and uh, my colleague has reminded me that it's a capital city. Uh, I think I may have been of another city uh, in the west, which is the maiden city. But the, the new bridge will provide improved connections across the River Lagan between Belfast City Centre and the Titanic Quarter. The bridge will also help to promote the Queen's Quay area to potential developers. And, and I have to say, yes, there, there's always been, uh, and I was only in post, I think, uh, it might have been the second event that I, do, I did when I took up uh, office was to go down and see uh, the uh, commencement of the works. And at that stage, uh, people were raising concerns as to why there was a huge investment of £5.5 .5 million. Pounds. But I think that that is a good investment. I think it will give a, a tremendous connectivity between uh, the Titanic uh, Quarter and Lord Queen's Douglas. Quay. Uh, and the member makes reference to North Belfast and the rest of our city. Uh, and I think you already can see uh, an anticipation uh, in the lead up to the, the bridge hopefully being handed over. And I look forward very soon by the end of this month to be in a position where we can officially uh, have the bridge open and it will be another added asset to this great city and also to the Ligon uh, which it crosses. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Daffy Mackay. Mr. Mackay. Guru I'll ask Anne Clear. Can I ask the Minister what work his department is doing in conjunction with the community, voluntary, and charity sectors uh, to address problems presented by pavement furniture uh, blocking access for pedestrians? This is always an issue that does raise in terms of the, the issue in regards to uh, public realm schemes. And uh, when uh, public rail schemes are, are taken on board, uh, it is always, uh, as far as I am concerned, I trust for those who are involved in the, in the delivery of these schemes, that every uh, concern is being uh, heeded, and whether it is in relation to uh, those who have uh, particular physical disabilities or whether it is some other disability, particularly we have had uh, issues in the past in relation to uh, guide dogs for the blind, that all of these issues are taken on board in a very practical way. In fact, just a few days ago, I was made aware of a particular scheme where I think it hadn't been followed in a way which I think gave us a good outcome, and I've asked for that particular issue to be looked at again. For Girl, Michael, ask, can I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, and can I ask, can he fully uh, support and can his department fully support recommendations made by disability groups in relation to the development of the regulation of pavement cafes? Yes, and again, uh, we have, we're aware of, of those particular recommendations. They are currently being given consideration, and I trust that we'll be able to give a positive response in a way that is uh, equitable and, and tries to strike the balance between the needs of uh, the uh, traders who have expressed their particular issues in relation to this, but also uh, in relation to the needs of pedestrians. Well, Mr. Barry Michael Duff for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister if he appreciates that independent advice organisations are facing much greater demand for their services at this time than ever before, and yet very many of them have seen their funding remain static effectively for the past 10 years and more? Yes, and uh, obviously uh, I value very much the work that the independent advice sector uh, provides for us and, in, and the member will be well aware of the challenges that we have in this house uh, in relation to budget, in relation to making decisions that are difficult and in fact because of requests from his own party we've had to uh, re take some money from the block grant and divert it into other needs which he and his colleagues have seen 
as being a priority, particularly in relation to welfare. And uh, we have done that in a comprehensive agreement. Unfortunately, the member uh, and his party uh, currently are stalling the implementation of that agreement that we made. But I continue to be a supporter of the independent advice sector. I continue to be one who, through the various funding arrangements that we have, give them support, give them the financial assistance that they need in a way that they can continue to deliver the service in the expert way that they have done to date. Uh, thank you, Alias uh, Corlia. Can I ask the Minister uh, specifically now, zoning into the current needs of OMA independent advice services, to ensure that senior officials from his department will work closely and directly with OMA independent advice services in order to fix a hole in its finances, a current deficit which I understand runs to £12,000 for the current year? Well, I think that this is the benefit of this House uh, because all politics is local. And uh, I appreciate the fact that the member has a particular issue in relation to that uh, matter that he has raised. And I would be quite happy for the member if he supplies, and now that he has given it to us in terms of the House, for my officials to look at the particular need, to look at the issue, and to see what help uh, can be given in the circumstances that the service that's currently under stress in OMA uh, delivers. Mr. John McAllister for a topical question. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, um, with regard to the ongoing debate in welfare reform and budgets, at what point will his department be unable to actually pay people benefits? And will they have also have to look at replacing IT equipment as well that's going to be outdated and working on two different systems? When does he hit that problem? The member, and obviously this is an issue which is at, uh, part of the, the problems that we currently face. In fact, a correspondence from the previous Chief Secretary and the Deputy Prime Minister, when we had the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Mr Clegg, gone back uh, some time ago, indicated then to the Executive that they needed to make decisions on how it wanted to provide uh, Social Security as uh, DWP would start to withdraw from its IT contracts in mid-2016. Now, that's one element of uh, the issue. The other element is in terms of the budget. And if we cannot find an agreed solution in relation to the budget, uh, and if we were to find ourselves in the position where uh, the finances of this House were under the control of the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, uh, it would certainly create a huge challenge for us. And by August uh, of this year, uh, and that's not that many weeks away. We would be in a very difficult and a very challenging position, and in fact, it would and could result in a situation where some of the element of the AMI that comes uh, in terms then of the way in which it is actually delivered on the ground, uh, which is, uh, can be specific in regards to certain benefits, uh, could be put in jeopardy, and there are some benefits that might not be paid. Mr. McAllister, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister uh, for his reply. I suppose on that uh, point, if some benefits are not been going to be paid, would the Minister care uh, to elaborate is how exactly does this ongoing fight on welfare and budget then, and it get to the situation that he has outlined, how does that help the vulnerable? Well, I think the member is absolutely right in terms of it doesn't help because what we are doing by constant delay is ratcheting up for ourselves in totality problems that affect everybody in Northern Ireland. And yes, I believe that at Stormont House we endeavoured in good faith to ensure that we had a comprehensive agreement of which five parties made a contribution to and signed up to. And now and then we were in the process of implementing that. And what I cannot understand, and I have not been able, despite all the smoke screens, despite all the diversions that have been put up over the last number of weeks, despite all, I have to say, the misinformation that has been out there about uh, papers not being given and uh, people acting in bad faith, why it was that when we had an agreement in January, the beginning of this year, it was sold by the member uh, parties opposite. It was advocated as being a new dawn, a new day. 
It was help to the vulnerable. It was uh, a process whereby we were getting to terms while dealing with issues. And then all of a sudden, at that fateful weekend in March, something dramatically changed. We know, of course, what it was. It wasn't the focus on the people of Northern Ireland. It was when a party is looking two ways, and its vision and its focus is on an election that they hope will come in the Irish Republic. My challenge and my call to the party uh, opposite and to the SDLP, who unfortunately became uh, conspirators on this issue, along with the single Green Party, when single Green Party member, when they signed the petition of concern, is let's implement the agreement that we made. Let's ensure that we don't create any more vulnerable people, and let's deal with the issues that are going to give to the people of Northern Ireland clarity, certainty, and in a way that doesn't create more vulnerability for people who at this minute in time, I believe, are saying, as far as this place is concerned, they've lost all confidence in this House. Call Mr Martin Muller for a topical question. Corley, can I bring the Minister back to the Ligon and to the inner city and the markets area, if that's not too much to ask? I would like to get an update on the environmental improvement scheme, which is planned for the market. I don't want to give away my supplementary, but there's been more planning than action, Minister. Well, I don't have the specific details with me in relation to that particular scheme, but what I'm quite happy to do is to give the member uh, an update in regards to it, because I want to ensure in that scheme, as opposed to, uh, uh, as considered to any of the others, that we continue to make progress. But the progress can only be made whenever there is a working together of all the agencies concerned, and we have the overall amount of budget which is made available to deliver these schemes. Mr. Muller, for supplement. Uh, and, and, and thank you, Minister, as well. Um, I suppose the problem is that phase three and four of the environmental improvement scheme never happened. Uh, what I would like to ask the Minister, you have been in, in, in Sandy Row, which is almost a partner area in development with the market. Uh, we, we did invite you in before Christmas. There was a crisis in government. Then we thought before Minister there was another crisis. Uh, we probably won't make it for the summer, but I do hope, Minister, you will take up the invite to visit the market to see the great work that's going on there in partnership with surrounding communities. And the environmental improvements can be a key part of that. Yeah, well, the member makes reference to, and rightly so, in terms of phases three and four. I think that uh, it is certainly a challenge to uh, ensure that we see delivery. But the crisis that he makes reference to, I trust, weren't of my making, uh, and it is no reflection of my good will to try and see the delivery of the project that undoubtedly would have a huge impact uh, for the people in the markets area and would make a, a huge impact onto their well-being and their quality of life. And whether it's this scheme or whether it's, it's others, that, uh, and there's a myriad of these, there's, there's a, a, a multiplicity of schemes that I have been involved with and my department have been involved with over the last number of months and years. And I think that what we need to ensure we, we don't do is lose the focus of how important it is for the communities that want to see these projects delivered. For other members who have a very cavalier attitude to this, that we shouldn't be spending this amount of money and we should be spending it on other things, I think sometimes we need to take cognizance of the communities that we're delivering these projects in and listen to their voices and listen to their concerns and try as best we possibly can to deliver for them. Mr Stephen Mutry for a topical Thank question. You, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister how much money did the benefits uptake programme generate uh, in the past year? I thank the, the member for his question in relation to the benefits uptake. And what we have seen, I think of all the uh, benefits that, and uh, excuse me uh, for using the, the, the phrase or the, the pun in terms of benefit uptake, uh, I think that it has been one of the most successful uh, schemes that we have engaged in. And I continue to be committed to promoting the uptake of the benefits in an effort to tackle poverty and improve the lives for those most vulnerable. And in 1314, over 4,000 people, many of them being our uh, older generation, gained somewhere in the region of 14.2 million in the new and additional benefits. And in fact, since 2005, benefit uptake work has generated over 81 million pounds in additional income for people in Northern Ireland. And this is an additional income for the people uh, in Northern Ireland. Mr Mutri for supplementary. Uh, thank you and I thank the Minister for that very uh, positive answer. Can I ask the Minister what plans are in place for further 
uh, improving the uptake of benefits for this financial year? Uh, the department's entering into the final year the maximising incomes and outcomes, which was a, a three-year strategy to improve the uptake of benefits. An action plan for 15-16 is in place and it continues to prioritise and invest resources in programmes and activities aimed at encouraging the uptake of benefit services and supports. And officials are due to present the action plan to the Social Development Committee on the 18th of June. And I think that will give the uh, committee and give members of the House an insight into how we intend to address this particular uh, issue over the next three years. And could I say to the member and to uh, not only uh, for his own constituency, but to members right across the House, that we should continue to encourage uh, our people to make the call uh, to ensure that they have done uh, that so that they can see uh, what may be potentially available for them. And given the fact that we're talking about a considerable amount of money over the number of years, I think it's well worth taking the effort to make that call because it will undoubtedly uh, bring a reward. Mr. Tom Elliott for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, um, I know since the Stormont House uh, agreement uh, proposals, there have been a number of papers back and forth. I'm just wondering how many papers the, the Minister or the Department uh, has produced in, in relation to uh, welfare mitigation schemes since the Stormont House proposals. Remember that there are five papers that uh, the Department has been in the production of since the Stormont House agreement. I'm afraid time has beaten us. Time is up. Uh, members